Okay, we'll go ahead and get straight right into this. This is lab nine, day two, uh, second part of a two-day lab uh, having to do with uh, detecting GMO-derived food sources. If you recall, if you look at the screen here, it shows you uh, what we were talking about, uh, isolating the gene of interest that codes for a protein that can help you modify and enhance another organism. It's not enough to isolate the gene, but you also have to uh, attach that gene uh, upstream of it to a promoter, in this case it was a CAMV promoter, and downstream of the gene you have to attach a terminator sequence, in this case known as a NOS terminator, and it just so happens these are the two sequences that were being targeted using a technique called PCR. PCR is DNA replication in a tube, however you, rep you choose the DNA that you want to replicate, therefore PCR is a technique that you can use to detect or determine if a food source was derived from a GMO plant. So if you look here, the purpose of this lab is to describe how DNA agarose gel electrophoresis can be used to separate DNA by size, uh, how to load an agarose gel, construct a DNA marker standard curve. This is comparable to this protein standard curve you did for the SDS page, and calculate DNA base pair sizes, and then how to interpret your electrophoresis results so you can draw a conclusion as to whether or not using this technique called PCR, were you able to determine if your test food was derived from a GMO plant source or from a non-GMO plant source. So DNA gel electrophoresis, okay, this process, we're going to use this technique in order to determine if our PCR reactions were successful as well as uh, able to determine if the test food, okay, was derived from a GMO plant source. Now, to do this, okay, you take your PCR reactions, which are in solution, or solutions, uh, and you will add them or load them in an agarose gel and carry out what we call DNA gel electrophoresis. Now, agarose itself is a polysaccharide, uh, or another way we put it, a seaweed extract that is a polysaccharide. Now, what we do is we take this agarose, this seaweed extract, okay, and we mix it with the buffer and we boil it. And then what we'll normally do is we'll pour it into a tray so that when it solidifies, it solidifies into a gel that usually has a square or rectangular shape to it, except that when it solidifies into the gel, it is actually a porous gel. Okay. And we're able to take this porous gel and use it to help separate what we refer to as DNA fragments, linear pieces of DNA. Okay. The unit of measurement we use to describe these linear pieces of DNA that we call in lay terms DNA fragments is base pairs or BPs. And the way it works is much the same as it did with SDS page. Okay. The greater the number of base pairs or the longer the DNA fragment, the harder the time it has migrating through the pores in the gel, therefore it migrates very slowly. The fewer the number of base pairs or the smaller the DNA fragment, the easier the time it has moving through the pores or the faster it migrates through the gels. And much like again with the SDS page, they'll appear, the DNA fragments will appear as bands, but each band actually is made up of a concentration of or a large number of DNA fragments of the link, which is what they're showing you here, but this is how it looks more to you. This is showing you what it actually consists of, okay? Now the agarose gel itself, okay, unlike SDS page where the gel is standing up, the way it works for the agarose gel is once it solidifies, we keep it in the tray that it solidifies in, and we set the tray down in a gel box to where the gel is parallel to the bench top that the gel box is sitting on or is placed on. Now, when that gel is boiled and poured into the tray, we also add, which is not shown here, we also add what we call a comb. Okay, and this comb would be placed into the gel so when the gel solidifies, it creates what we call wells. These wells are used to load our DNA samples. So here it doesn't give you a good image of the well, okay, but on this figure, you can see here they're showing you the DNA samples that are being loaded have a little color. I'll explain that in a second. But you can see here where the blue color is in the gel where the DNA samples have been loaded. You can see that, uh, how do you say, highlights where the wells are, okay, in the gel. And this is just showing you how the well would be shaped. Now, when we put the gel in the gel box, okay, you have to be careful that you place the gel in the correct orientation. The wells always have to be located closer to the side where a negative charge is going to be emitted or the cathode is, okay, and away from the side where a positive charge is going to be emitted or where the anode is. 
Also, the gel will be submerged in the buff in a buffer solution, a salt buffer solution, okay, that helps conduct the electrical current through the gel. So you can see here this gray area here represents the buffer solution that the gel is submerged in. Now, unlike SDS page, where usually your protein samples are colorless after you add your denaturing reagent or glycerol, the way it works for DNA, your DNA samples and solutions, is that you combine them with the loading buffer solution. And that loading buffer solution is going to have some color to it. Now, the color is going to be provided, in this case, by the tracking dye, okay? Unlike what we had with SDS page. So, if, had we performed this technique in person, or both techniques, SDS page and DNA gel electrophoresis, okay, you would have seen that loading your DNA samples into the gel is much, much easier than loading protein samples into an SDS page or a polyacrylamide gel. So that loading buffer has tracking dye, and the tracking dye serves the same purpose. It's made up of small negatively charged molecules that will migrate faster through the gel, okay, than any other molecules in the gel. But in this case, the tracking dye is also giving the solution, the DNA solution color. So you can actually see where the DNA, your DNA samples are being loaded into the wells. But as I said, the gel will be submerged in a buffer. So in addition to the tracking dye, we will have that same chemical that we use for SDS page called glycerol, made up of dense molecules to increase the density of your DNA sample. That way, when you're going to load your DNA samples, you use a micropipette, and the micropipette tip actually has to penetrate the surface of the buffer solution. So this pipette tip is actually, uh, how do you say, inserted into the buffer solution, but just above the well. And then when you eject your DNA sample, the glycerol ensures that the DNA sample will just float down and settle to the bottom of the well, as you can see here. And none of it floats away in, this, in the solution, so we don't lose it. I already talked about the tracking dye here. Often the tracking dye consists of chemicals called xylene cyanol or bromophenol blue, but in this case, the tracking dye we use, okay, I don't have it on here, I'm sorry, it's over here. The tracking dye that we use, I'm losing it here, I'm sorry about this. Uh, the tracking dye we use is, is called uh, orange G tracking dye. Okay, so this orange G that we use uh, which we call it. it actually will help our samples appear more of an orange color than it will this color here. So the color would have been different, but you still would have been able to see it. I have it on here somewhere, and I don't know why I'm having a break for it. But uh, basically, you can see your samples being loaded as you're loading them. Now, unlike with SDS page, where you stain your protein gel with the colorless proteins after you've done the electrophoresis part, okay, with DNA agarose gel electrophoresis, we actually add the stain that will stain your DNA molecules. We actually add it to the gel solution that is being boiled. Okay, so the gel itself, before we ever add your DNA samples to the wells, which I'm pointing at up here, before you ever load or add your DNA samples to these wells, the gel already contains the chemical that will stain your DNA. So if you look here, bands are visible. DNA bands are only visible after a gel has been treated with DNA-specific stain. So the way it works is we use a fluorescent stain known as cyber green. Okay. And as it says here, cyber green is pre-mixed into the agarose gel. So when the agarose gel solidifies, it consists of many molecules of this fluorescent cyber green. In this, so that in this case, what happens now is as, once you start the electrophoresis process, as the DNA starts moving through the pores of the agarose gel, okay, it begins to trap some of this cyber green in it. In other words, it picks up some of this cyber green. Therefore, what's happening? The DNA is being stained with that cyber green. So once the gel electrophoresis process is stopped based on where the tracking dye has migrated to, so keep in mind the tracking dye lets us know when to stop the electrophoresis process. Based on once the tracking dye has migrated far enough that we stop the electrophoresis process, okay, there's no staining of the gel after the electrophoresis process is stopped. You simply take your gel out of the gel box and out of the buffer solution, place it on a UV light source, and this is what it'll look like, what it's showing you here. This is actually one of the gels that was that students, um, from one of the stu uh, groups of students, uh, that was successful in their PCR experiments.
Now, unlike proteins, okay, DNA and all nucleic acids naturally have a net negative charge. Okay, so in other words, nucleic acids have a net negative charge. So we don't have to treat your DNA samples, okay, with an anionic detergent such as SDS. Another thing is we don't have to treat your DNA samples with a denaturing reagent because the DNA that you're adding to, that's in your DNA solutions, it's linear fragments of DNA that haven't folded up, taking on any particular shape. They're basically linear, as I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, they're just like strands. This helps, okay, uh, reduce the time it takes to prepare your DNA samples to load into the gel. But once you load your DNA samples into the gel, these DNA samples have a negative charge naturally to them. We'll talk about this if you make sure you watch the video for chapter 16. It explains why they have a negative charge. It has to do with the, the phosphate groups of the DNA nucleotides. Now, what will happen is once you've loaded your DNA samples, okay, in the wells located next to, the, next to the cathode end, the cathode will emit a negative charge. So like charges repel each other. So basically what's happening is when the cathode starts emitting a negative charge, that starts pushing your DNA into the gel. From the opposite end of the gel, we have the anode. The anode starts to emit a positive charge. This attracts your DNA, pulling it through the gel. So basically, it's a push from this end and a pull from this end based on charge attraction or repulsion. So that helps your DNA migrate through the gel from there. Okay, The greater the number of base pairs that make up your DNA fragment, or simply the longer or larger your fragment is, the slower it migrates through the gel. The fewer the number of base pairs that make up your DNA fragment, or the shorter your fragment is, the faster it's able to migrate through the gel because it has an easier time getting through the pores in the gel. So that's what this is all talking about right here, everything that I just talked about here. So I'm going to jump ahead and make sure you do read this slide. Now also, what you, what, you, what you would normally do in person is you would also be given the sample. So you have a total of seven samples to load into your gel. Thus, you can see here this gel is lo lo uh, numbered. Wells are numbered one through seven. We call this a DNA marker, but in actuality, you, in the lab, we usually just refer to it as a DNA ladder. This DNA marker or ladder consists of DNA molecules with different known base pair sizes. So this is what the DNA marker contains. It has DNA molecules with different known base pair sizes. And I'll go over some of these sizes in a bit. And you can see here how they separate. And you can use this, okay, for two purposes. One, to create a DNA sta marker standard curve, as well as going left to right, going across the gel, to help you get an idea of what size fragments of DNA have been replicated in your PCR reactions if the target DNA was present. So listen carefully. This is, sli this is slide 11. You want to feed off of slide 11. I'm just trying to help guide you through what you need to do uh, for your lab, not including the pre-lab. You still have to do the pre-lab, but this is just to help you get into the post-lab as well as labeling gel pick. Once you have completed the electrophoresis and your agarose gel has been photographed, okay, which I've provided the photograph for you, you will analyze the gel picture. So it's been given to you on page five of your lab. You will analyze the gel. Okay, the first thing I want you to do is label that gel picture. When you label that gel picture, use slide 12. This is slide 12. It says here, this is a sample of a labeled gel picture. You'll do the same thing with your gel picture. Okay, number the wells going left to right, one to seven. Along the uh, left side, you can create a little legend or key explaining what was added to sample to well one, well two, well three, well four, well five, well six. The ladder, the DNA marker or ladder is added to well seven. One more thing, make sure you do this because not everybody was labeling the tracking die for the SDS page deal. This is real simple, everybody. Okay, make sure you're labeling everything I'm telling you to. I also want you to label what we call primer dimers. The reason why I want you to do that is because I also want you to write down when you label them to ignore them. What happens during a PCR reaction is you have primers 
that don't have any target sequence to bind to usually, or it's excess primer, it was too much you used. So these primers will anneal to each other, they'll attach to each other forming primer dimers. So you can see the primer dimers are here where the arrows are pointing at. So this right here and this right here, okay, what I circled, these are not comparable to what we're interested in. These are the DNA fragments we're interested in analyzing. These are the DNA fragments that we're interested in focusing on to create the DNA standard curve. Okay, these are just primer dimers, which we ignore. Okay, if, and so uh, make sure that you notice this and notice something. I actually put, okay, the length of the different fragments that are contained in that DNA marker or ladder that you would have loaded into seven. Notice the primer dimers migrate faster than the smallest or shortest DNA fragment in your DNA marker solution. So that lets you know where to look for these markers so you know what to ignore as you continue to, to answer the questions in your lab. Now, once you have that done, second, you wanna construct a DNA marker standard curve. So follow the instructions on pages six and seven and when you create that DNA marker standard curve, you're creating a graph beginning with a scatter plot. And the graph itself is going to be placed, okay, under question number one in the post lab. So what you'll do, okay, for the, it's going to tell you on page six, hey, measure the distance starting from the bottom of the well. The bottom of the well is zero. Measure the distance counting up going in this direction. Okay. You will measure the distance to the 100 base, 1,000 base pair fragment migrates to 700 base pair fragment, 500, 200, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, 200 to 100 base pair fragments. So you're going to have five measurements, okay, that you're going to measure. You're going to record those where it tells you to record those. Then what it's going to tell you to do next is once you've measured the distance of each of these fragments on page seven, it's going to tell you what you're going to do to create your standard curve on page seven so you'll fill this in okay now granted you're not going to turn this in but you're going to fill this in this and what's going to happen is when you create your standard curve you want to use slide 13 this is slide 13 to help you out so once you've created your graph compare your graph to this graph here on slide 13 notice something okay for the slide you will in order to create this graph you will take the log of the DNA base pairs of each fragment in your DNA marker. So you'll take the log of 1000, you'll take the log of 700, the log of 500, and it tells you why it, on, on page seven, it tells you why, which is simply to help create a, a nicer graph to work with. But notice something, okay? You are not calculating any RF values. So again, listen carefully, there are no RF values used. You are simply going to take the distance that each of these fragments migrated, that it starts asking you to measure on page six, okay, and that's going to represent your x-axis. The log of your fragments is going to be represented by the y-axis, and that's also set up here on top, okay? So once you measure the distance that each fragment migrated down the lane, lane seven, the distance it migrated, you've already got the data you need for the x-axis. All you got to do is take the log of each uh, different fragment size in the DNA marker, create your graph, notice it has a negative slope, ask it to do a trend line equation giving you y equals mx plus b, show that on the graph you're going to need that uh, to help you do another part of the post lab. Once you have that standard curve, then it's going to tell you next you want to measure the migration distance of your plant PCR and GMO PCRs. This is on page eight. You're going to need the gel. So notice something. You'll start off by, if you want, by measuring the distances that your template DNA samples combined with your plant primers. You can start with these three, the distance they migrated. Keep in mind for all three of these, these were all controls. Keep in mind, you had three DNA templates. One was a non, one consisted of non-GMO plant DNA. One consisted of GMO plant DNA that contained GMO DNA. And then your third template DNA was plant DNA, but the plant DNA was from your test food, and you wanted to determine did it also have GMO DNA, or was it from a non-GMO plant source? Okay.
all three samples of DNA that you were either given, that would have been given, or that you would have extracted from your test food, all three DNA samples would have contained plant DNA that had chloroplast DNA. Therefore, all three of these PCR reactions should have come out positive. In other words, there should have been a target sequence, a chloroplast DNA sequence that should have been replicated to the point that we had a large enough quantity of the same linked fragments of chloroplast DNA that we could visualize it or see it in the gel where it's detected. Here you can see this is a positive result that we should have gotten for our controls using the plant primers. In addition, in lane five, okay, had you done this in person, this would have not only told you the PCR reaction worked also for your test food, it would have told you you were successful in extracting DNA from your test food because sometimes, especially with uh, foods like papaya, it's really hard to extract the DNA. Okay, so when you have, see your gel, make sure you have a fragment. Well, notice the fragment. This chloroplast DNA sequence that was replicated using the plant primers, if you come over here to the ladder, notice it's roughly 500 base pairs approximately. So you know where to look for that to know it's a positive result. But it also ask you to, it's also going to ask you to measure the distance that your GMO PCR samples migrated. Well, you may or may not have something. Keep in mind, again, for these, you'll be looking at sample or lanes 2, 4, and 6. This is where you combined your, you combined your template DMOs, uh, I'm sorry, your template DNAs with your GMO primers. Okay, so that's going to be lane two, four, and six. Well, keep in mind, lane two, you were given plant DNA that did not have GMO DNA, so the GMO primers didn't have anything to anneal to, to bind to. Therefore, DNA polymerase did not have any GMO DNA to replicate. This is what it looks like if there is no GMO DNA to replicate. Notice this is a primer dimer. How did, how did I say to identify it? Look for anything that looks like a DNA fragment that migrates faster than this 100 base pairs in the DNA marker, then you know that's a primer dimer. Ignore it. It's not part of the results. This is what it looks like. Okay, so in other words, this is what your test food will look like if it is from a non-GMO plant source. However, if you recall, number four, you were given plant DNA that contained GMO DNA. Therefore, for PCR reaction number four, you took this plant DNA that contained GMO DNA, combined it with GMO primers, which did find GMO DNA, the target sequence, to anneal or attach to. Therefore, that GMO DNA was replicated. And you can see here we got the positive result that was expected versus the negative result for two that was expected. These are the control DNAs. Okay. Well, notice here. This is what the GMO DNA, how far it should have migrated in the gel, or another way to put it, come over here. And the GMO DNA, if it's present, okay, what is replicated should have a length of roughly 200 base pairs if you compare it to your DNA ladder. From there, what you'll do then is you'll look at lane six, and you first have to determine, is there any GMO DNA that was detected? If there was, you'll have a band at roughly 200, just like you did in your positive control. If there was no GMA, then lane six is going to look like lane two, and well, you don't have to worry about any measurements because there's nothing to measure. Then what you're going to do is you're going to take these measurements along with the trend line equation, okay, that it asks you to, to uh, ask the program to do for your standard curve, and you're going to take the data from both of these, the standard curve and your measurements for your plant PCR and GMO DNA, and you're going to use it in the post lab to help you calculate the best pair sizes of your plant PCR and GMO PCRs, okay? You should have an answer for all three templates for plant. You should only have an answer for one or two for the GMO, okay? The G plant DNA that contains GMO, your positive control, and then whether or not you have a second sample to calculate the base pair size depends on the test food, whether or not it was derived from a GMO source. That'll be questions two and three. Okay. Okay. Then questions four and five are simply going to say, based on all this analysis that you've done, draw a conclusion. It's, question four is basically going to say, were, did the plant PCR primers uh, detect the chloroplast DNA in all your samples like they should have? Okay. And then question five is going to focus on, was your test food from a GMO plant source?
So I didn't go this up. Make sure you go over this information. It's just talking about the plant and GMO primers. This is just showing you the figure again. When you do your comparisons, okay, when you answer questions four and five, make sure when you give your answer, you give your answers by telling me by comparing lanes one, three, and five for the plant primers in your plant DNA for question four. And for question five, when you give me your answer, give me your answer by indicating you compared lane six, your test food with GMO primers, okay, to your positive and negative controls in lanes two and four. So you want to make sure you're indicating to me what lanes you're comparing to draw your conclusions. So your report, you're going to have some data that you're writing down, okay, to help you uh, answer your, uh, create your graph and answer your post lab questions that you may not turn in, okay, but you're definitely going to give me your pre-lab questions and answers. Uh, label that gel pick that's given to you, I believe, on uh, given to you on page five, okay, and make sure you add that on. Uh, before the post-lab questions, but after the pre-lab, and then give me your pre-lab answers there. Okay, y'all take care now. Bye.